front end is a wild, wild world nowadays, and somebody's finally put this all in an iceberg. If you're not already familiar, the iceberg meme format is a way of showing how things get more complex as you get deeper into them. And Lee Rob from Vercel made an incredible iceberg showing a bunch of different things that front end devs have to deal with. Captioned, front end is easy which is really funny if you've had to deal with any of these problems and you understand that front end is not actually particularly easy. This iceberg took a lot of work on his part and I'm super lucky that he's down for us to share it here and react to it because there's some really funny stuff in there. So without further ado, let's dive straight into the shallows of the front end iceberg. In the shallows, we have relatively common stuff that hopefully we're all familiar with, like index.html, div, and button. We also snuck a B and I in here for bold and italic, which is nice to have there. But also font size, 16 pixels. I feel attacked because I think base font size of 16 makes a lot of sense. And for readability, it's what most stuff should use but a lot of people really like smaller base font sizes. Regardless, 16's a really nice starting point. Let's go a little bit deeper though, because this is where things start to get fun. We immediately have script tag, image tag, and form. All three of these have so many behaviors that you might not know about, and hopefully you haven't had to worry too much about. Iframe's even worse though. I would have put this a layer deeper, personally. And then this one we bickered about a bit. There was an accidental bracket wrapping this function call here. This is supposed to be the equivalent of document.ready inside of jQuery. So if you're using jQuery, this syntax minus the brackets is how you have a jQuery function run as soon as the document is done loading. Here's where things start to get a little uneasy though. We have use effect, which uh, we've done a bit of content about already. If you're not already familiar with use effect, it's the pattern in React for having well, reactive data flows. So if you want something to run when a specific value changes, use effect is how you do it. Also the way you tend to attach things into and out of React and its syntax is weird and there's a lot of very real foot guns with it. So putting it here makes a lot of sense. Centering a div is a wonderful meme. Not always the easiest thing, but it has gotten a lot easier nowadays with Flexbox. Surprised the word flex isn't in here anywhere. Might come up later. Unit tests in front end in particular are uh, an interesting wild ride. Definitely check out some of my content about those. If you haven't already, I have a lot of thoughts on unit testing. Link preload and prefetch. Oh boy. Link is how you would attach things like, oh God, Link could be used to attach a lot of different things to your document. Primarily it's used for CSS and which behavior you attach here determines a lot of things about when that CSS loads and when the content of the page actually shows up and helps you prevent things like that CSS jank when the page flashes in unstyled. Preload and prefetch for links allow you to get around a good bit of that. It also allows you to preload different CSS you don't need just yet if other pages might need it in the future. Fun stuff. Oh man, the rest here though. Responsive layouts, oof my soul. Yeah, uh, responsive is one of those things that should have gotten better over the years and hasn't. Like, it's truly hilarious that there's no easy way to make a website that works well on mobile and on a computer without having to be an expert in both and like how responsive containers work. I feel like Grid somehow made this worse, not better. Regardless, responsive layouts are still very much a challenge. And if you have a website that actually works well on web and mobile without rendering entirely different UIs, good for you. Proud of you. Not easy. Linting. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> linting should be easy. I am annoyed that it isn't. The amount of effort it takes to get linting set up properly in modern web projects is a little bit horrifying, if I'm going to be completely honest. Yeah, it's not great. The history from ESLint to TSLint to the two merging to Rome trying and failing, It's and then the weird relationship between that and Prettier, it's chaos. Hopefully this will get fixed someday. Anyways, CSS Cascade. If you haven't already watched my video on StyleX, you should check that one out because I and Facebook are very well aligned that Cascade has too many weird behaviors that are hard to understand and your CSS should affect the thing that it is attached to and ideally not affect anything beyond that. Obviously like color and font size probably should be inherited, but the vast majority of behaviors cascading is hard to work with and impossible to debug. So while I know plenty of people have made awesome things happen with Cascade and are very, very good at CSS as a whole, I think this has come at a net negative for most people, for better or worse. And yeah, it is what it is. Anyways, float. Oh, float. I have never had a floating element work and float types are rough too. I This could be a lot of different floats and none of them work how I expect them to. Surprise sticky didn't make its way in there too, but yeah, good luck. <sighs> Shall we go a bit deeper? I think we should. Here's where things are gonna start getting a little bit more painful. <laughs> and obviously we start in this next section with cores. Drop a one if cores has hurt you and drop a two if cores has never hurt you. There you guys go. Anyways, lots of 
additional fun to talk about here. End-to-end -end tests. I I like end-to-end -end tests, but setting them up right is nearly impossible. All of the like chaos around Puppeteer and Cypress and all of the other tools for headless Chrome, it's rough. It's gotten better, but it's still not a happy story. And I think putting that here makes a lot of sense. Input validation. Again, we've gotten a lot better, but once you're combining that input validation with forms and feedback and all of these additional pieces, getting good validation of input can be scary. And as we just saw with Zod having yet another massive exploit around the regex for emails, this isn't a fixed problem. We will continue having more and more chaos around input validation as we go forward, but hopefully we'll get better in the future. Somebody in chat just mentioned server and client validation sync. I would hope something like Zod helps there, but it's not perfect, especially if you're running a different backend language from your front end and have different validation methods on both. Yeah, it can get rough. And as someone else said, like you still have to validate on server, even if you validate on client, because somebody can just post to the endpoint, which is also very important. So despite validating on the client, even if you get it perfect, you now also separately have to validate that on the server. Blah. Anyways, let's get into something we all love, hydration errors. If you're not already a deep React dev that does a decent bit of SSR, you might never have had a hydration error, in which case I envy you because they suck. To put it simply, hydration errors are what happens when the server generates HTML with React and then the client resumes that HTML with React and the results are different when it does that. The most common time I see this is when the server's in a different time zone than the user's device and they render a date time because the server will render that date time, maybe it's GMT and it's tomorrow, but on the user's device, it's today, then you end up with a hydration error between the server and the client because the client, when it tries to run the same JavaScript code against the same data, it ends up generating different HTML. You can also have this if you just have a math.random that runs on the server and on the client. But yeah, you, you, hydration errors suck. They happen for a lot of different reasons. And if you haven't encountered them before, I envy you. They aren't fun. They do get a lot better with server components because you don't have to rerun the code on the client and the server all of the time anymore, but you still have to worry about these things a bit. Let's keep going because font size, 14 pixels, I don't know if this is all one or if this is two different things. Let's Google search it quick. Ah, it is one thing. <laughs> Today I learned for, for those who haven't heard about this before, because this is new to me, if your font size is less than 16 on an input and you try to put things in that input on mobile web for Safari, it will zoom in. I always wondered what triggered that weird zoom when you click an input field on mobile. And now I know it's the font size and a hard coded behavior in Safari itself if your font size isn't big enough. Ow, that hurt deeply. Anyways, filter views. Filter views are fun. It's when you have a view that has some amount of data and you want to hide some of the data, be it you want to filter out things where the user ID doesn't exist or values where the age is less than 18. Building the UI for that can be very complex, especially if the data is paginated, which is a fun part right underneath here. If you have an API that returns 50 things at a time and then you apply a filter to only show, let's say, half of them, you now got 25 things, which means in maybe the next page you have 27 things. So you need to, on the back end, create those filters so that it always continues to return the 50 elements, this is where things start to get really rough. Somebody in chat just mentioned once you add an autocomplete, it gets impossible. And yeah, once you add an autocomplete, this gets really, really painful. Image source sets. Oof. There's a lot of different ways to specify source on images. I use the picture element for this personally, but yeah. Here you can see this weird syntax where you use this image with this specification, you use this image with this specification, and then you specify different sizes as well. And you still have a default source because you need this to work in things that don't support these tags. But yeah, now you have four tags on your image instead of two, oof, yeah. As Aiden just said in chat, he prefers to send the largest image and have the browser deal with it. Not the worst thing. And honestly, it's funny this is in here because it's kind of like a next image plug because next image does a lot of this for you automatically. You can specify a bunch of different props, but if I go to image.t3 and we inspect this element, you'll see this is an image tag that has a giant source set on it with a ton of different generated images. There's like literally like over a dozen different image sizes for that image for me. Just really convenient to just kind of have that. At media prints, the other one I didn't know. Intended for page material and documents viewed on a screen in print preview mode. God. Things I've never had to optimize for. I don't want to think about how things are different when I press Command P. It looks like they did for us here. But yeah, at media print is the tag you use when you want to have certain elements specified in the Command P print view. I'm so sorry to anybody who has to deal with that. My, my heart goes out to you genuinely. And then nan undefined null. What are you talking about? Those all make perfect sense. Nan is for things that aren't numbers. Undefined is for things that don't exist. And null is for things that don't, uh, oh, oh. 
Never mind, we'll continue. Layout shift. Uh, <laughs> oh, layout shift. This is another one of those things that Next has helped with a lot. If you're not already familiar, layout shift is what happens when things like the font loads and element loads in. You have a picture tag that wasn't there before, and now it is, and it causes other elements in the page to change where they are. Maybe the default font is slightly different sizing than the font you actually load in. It's a lot of pain there. And uh, yeah, layout shift is not fun. Infinite scroll. This is actually funny to put in here specifically because React server components have no solution for it. Uh, yeah, if you're not already familiar with infinite scroll, it's the concept that you take something that's paginated and as you scroll to the bottom of that view, like a list of something like tweets on Twitter, when you get to the end, it loads more automatically. Detecting that the user's at the point where they should infinite scroll is hard. Attaching the data in a way that doesn't shift the DOM and cause them to scroll somewhere else automatically is hard. Paginating properly so you can scroll up and down and can continue to like grab from the right point means you have to have your cursor set perfectly. And you also can't use SSR for this. So yeah, there's a lot of pieces that make this hard. Tanstack's infinite query solution in React Query is really nice and helps a lot. But if you're SSRing the first chunk of data, this can get rough fast. So yeah, infinite scroll is not fun. And it definitely fits here, if not possibly even deeper. Calendar UI is very funny as well. We've been dealing with this in web dev forever. There have been so many different date time pickers created, and there is now an official like input type is date. So here is the browser standard date time picker. It's actually built into Chrome now, which is really nice that this is an option and you don't have to go out of your way to build it yourself always, but not all browsers support it and the consistency of the UI for it is not there. So most people still tend to build their own. Regardless, that one can be nice to use the default just because it works well on mobile and you don't have to build a separate mobile path for your date time pickers and for your calendar. But yeah, calendar UIs are notoriously hard even just to pick a date, much less build a proper thorough calendar with lots of features. Funny issue I run into when I'm working on my calendar for my content is I have no way in the calendar for Notion to wrap the font for this. I'm surprised that line wrapping and like word wrapping isn't in this iceberg anywhere. But I also can't imagine how difficult it would be to have customization where I could specify how many layers these titles can wrap, even though it would make my life significantly easier. Let's move on to cache busting. There's another funny one for the next team to be including here because caching with app router is both incredibly powerful and pretty unintuitive. Dealing with cache as a web dev is not particularly easy. And as caches and cache methods continue to get more and more intricate, the ability to invalidate a cache is more and more important. Vercel did kind of pioneer a new method for this, the uh, incremental static regeneration. The concept for ISR is that you have a page that is generated possibly on request or on build, and the data for that page can get stale. You don't know when it will get stale. You can specify the point at which it determines that the page is stale, or you can manually call a revalidate. And this is where things get really powerful. The on-demand revalidation means if you have something like a blog post that has comments on it, you can generate that static HTML page with the comments and not have to hit your backend at all when people load the page. But then when a new comment is left, you can invalidate that page cache and generate a new page once per comment instead of once per visit. And this pattern is really, really powerful, but now you have to be confident all the places comments are left are triggering that invalidate. Otherwise you're going to be fetching a stale page. And this is where cache busting can get very, very problematic, very, very fast. CSS selector performance. Oh no. <laughs> Oh no. Yeah, CSS selectors are different ones perform different ways and different amounts. This is one of those things I'm really happy with Tailwind for because it has so little in terms of CSS selection. It just uses classes, which are one of the, as far as I know, most performant methods to target CSS. So I don't have to worry about this as much anymore. But when you have a ton of dynamic elements and a ton of weird methods of targeting them, CSS selectors can actually be pretty heavy load wise. And I don't want to know more about that. I don't want to read more into that. So I won't. To OAuth 2. Mm, I can we go back? I don't want to talk about OAuth. Oh God, I every time I think about OAuth, I hurt a little bit more. I was one of the earliest Next Auth proponents and I still love Next Auth. It's an incredible solution for what it does. There's also additional incredible open source solutions like Lucia Auth that are doing very well right now. The problem comes when you have to integrate OAuth with lots of different platforms, both in terms of the platforms people sign in with OAuth as well as on the client side. The problem you haven't thought of unless you've had it is how do you handle an OAuth sign in from something like Google or GitHub on mobile? Step one, you open a mobile view. Step two, trigger the sign-in, redirect to the service you want to do the OAuth with. Step three, they sign in there. Hopefully it will persist their info from the browser. It often won't because in-app browsers are a total mess. Step five, have it redirect to a URL that you've already pinned to your app and hope it actually gets there. Step six, you grab the token off of that URL redirect and hope again that it's actually there and it's located where it's supposed to. 
no guarantees. Step seven, you find some place to store it. it. And then you hope that that will apply correctly. And then you have to handle, manage, and revalidate that token over time, probably on your back end, and then get that to your mobile app in order to make sure it's up to date so your requests continue to work as expected. Yeah, OAuth sucks. It's really rough. And having implemented it both correctly and incorrectly while working at Twitch, as well as externally trying to consume services like Twitch, Aiden just said in chat, here's the easier solution. Make users manually type in a token. You say that <laughs> as though it's not the best solution sometimes, but I've definitely shipped apps where I required you to copy paste the token from web into mobile in order to get it working just to get something shipped. Maybe have even done that at Twitch at some points. Anyways, OAuth is not as easy as it seems. It usually stays stable and doesn't break, but if it does break, you're in hell. And this is why I've become such a fan of Clerk because they handle all of this for me with like two clicks. I pay Clerk because it solves my problem for me. Although I will disclose, I'm a Clerk investor and they do sponsor the channel. They have no idea I'm making this video. They just made OAuth much less painful for me. And because of them, I don't think about OAuth anywhere near as much anymore. So if you're like me and don't want to think about OAuth, maybe worth checking them out. Anyways, email CSS. On the topic of things I've invested in, <laughs> email sucks. Email templating sucks incredibly hard. It's one of the few things I would still pay an external developer like a contractor to do for us because doing email HTML and and CSS correctly so it works on multiple platforms is really, really painful. And I don't want to do it anymore. Because of that, there is a really cool project called react.email, which is an open source React package, similar to how you can use React Native to target native platforms or React 3 Fiber to target 3JS and 3D Canvas stuff, or even React PDF to do a PDF. React Email lets you write React code with their custom helpers. Instead of using div, you use their view element. But if you do that correctly, you can correctly set up an HTML template for an email with all the CSS and everything handled properly. They do that by intentionally limiting what set of things you can use in the email template. On the React email examples page, you have a ton of these dope examples that show you a recreation of a common email that you might've gotten yourself, like this GitHub access token example. And then it shows you the React code for using React email to generate this. And we see in React email, you have these components that all behave how you expect inside of an email. And now you can template this which is really nice if you want to generate an email in your React code and then send that out programmatically because like a user signed up on Next or something like that. It makes it way, way, way easier to think about your email in terms of your code and the stuff that you do. I mentioned a little joke about investing. The reason I did that is because React Email is a project by the company Resend, which is a Y Combinator company created by the same people that I'm really, really pumped with. I invested in them because it's going to solve so many problems for me and others. I think they're a great solution for email. I have invested in them. They never paid me for anything. I'm just that hyped on what they're doing. Bit more in this layer. It's getting more and more painful as we go. The event loop. Oh boy, the event loop. Fun fact, when I was leveling up as a developer, I made it a point to watch this particular talk, what the heck is the event loop anyway, from JSConf from eight years ago. And I would watch this every six months for like five years. And every time I watched it, I understood a bit more than I did the time before. It's a phenomenal talk. And even now, I still feel like I get a little bit of nuance that I didn't fully understand every time I watch it. I would consider this a must watch talk. I'll be sure it's pinned somewhere in the description of this video. So if you haven't already seen it, you can watch it. I've learned so much from this. The event loop is complex, but it's also one of the biggest strengths of JavaScript. And if you don't already understand it, I highly recommend that talk because it will help you be more confident in the JavaScript you write. Good talk. Great talk. This talk is gold. Mandatory. I make my engineers watch it once a year. This is the first time this person's messaged in chat. Yeah. Phenomenal talk. Highly, highly recommend it. User agents. <laughs> oh boy. So you might have noticed here, I'm using Chrome, but my user agent starts with Mozilla 5.0. It then follows with Apple WebKit 5.37. It then says KHTML comma like Gecko. Then it shows my actual browser, Chrome 117. And then it says Safari 537.36. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> the history of this is that as new browsers have come out and supported new features, and then newer browsers came out and supported those same features, they would include the user agents so that so websites built to support those features would support them. And even though obviously Chrome is not Mozilla 5.0, it does supposedly fully support all of the features from Mozilla 5.0, which is why it's included in my user agent. The order that these appear in matters. The specific syntax of like HTML comma like gecko matters. User agents are not fun and a lot of things fake them. You can't use them to guarantee anything. You can basically just use them to hope things are where we're supposed to be. And it's been miserable getting here. Regardless, they mostly do what they're supposed to, and I can mostly live life ignoring them. Two more in this section. 
Let's start with Wasm, because Wasm has one of the craziest histories and is one of the most misunderstood technologies in web dev. Wasm originally started as Wasm.js, which was a project with the goal of making it so you could compile code that wasn't in JavaScript to JavaScript. But when you did that, you were stuck with JavaScript's performance. So they started introducing syntax to JavaScript to allow you to, oh, sorry, Asm.js. Thank you, Primogen. So close. So the original Wasm proposal was in the form of Asm.js, which was a project to compile native code and native-like code to the browser. The performance of this was obviously not great, so they started doing more and more hacks, specifically adding syntax to specify certain elements are always going to be an int and, and generally trying to make that JavaScript code more optimizable to run faster on a native layer. This ended up being utter fucking chaos. They learned their lesson fast and Wasm became a focused standard to try and build native and native-like performance with direct memory management, garbage collection, and all those types of things so that you could compile native code to the browser. This code only runs inside of an isolate though. It's not actually directly controlling the DOM, which is one of the biggest misunderstandings I think people have with Wasm, is that it's not an alternative to JavaScript where you can just update things the same way you do in JS. Wasm works more like a worker where it runs separately, kind of, and has access to the DOM, kind of, but you have to build the relationship there and build the bridge there. Because of this, Wasm's use cases are less alternatives to React and more really, really performant ways to do things like video encoding or complex math for crazy transforms of images and such. Like Figma's a really heavy user of Wasm in order to optimize a lot of parts of their UI and the customization and the crazy vectors and math they have to run to modify images. But when it comes to actually moving things around in the DOM, that tends to still happen in JavaScript. There is definitely a future where we can call things from Wasm in the browser directly, and we'll start to see the gap between fast JS frameworks and Wasm frameworks close, maybe even Wasm frameworks performing faster than JavaScript alternatives. But because everything goes through that layer still, JavaScript's still faster for things that are focused primarily on updating the DOM really quickly. Somebody also brought up FFmpeg in chat. And FFmpeg in the browser and FFmpeg Wasm are absolutely things that I've put way too much time into. Really powerful tools, really hard to get working how you need them to. Wasm's cool, Wasm has a lot of potential. I don't think it's very well understood and is not gonna replace JavaScript. Anyways, my favorite part of this section, the one I've been putting off for this section, this. Oh, this. Ah, this hurts. This causes a lot of pain. And this is largely ignored by modern web devs, thankfully. If you guys aren't already familiar with JavaScript, the good parts, it's a very important book that normalized JavaScript not being fully hated. Douglas Crockford wrote this book in order to explain how you can use JavaScript to do some quality. And since then, Crockford has continued doing talks and is working on a book called JavaScript, the better parts. One of the strategies to keep things simple as you build at scale is to trim things that you don't absolutely need in order to keep the context you need in your head as you read changes, make changes, and move forward simpler. This has so many weird behaviors in so many weird places that life without it is much simpler. He actually talks a lot about this in here. Um, I don't think there's more slides on it, but he has a long rant within this where he talks about projects he was working on. He decided to stop using this. He expected it to be painful and ended up being surprisingly better. And when you leave behind these patterns, you end up in a place where the complexity of your code is a little easier to digest and understand and reusing parts becomes easier as well. I'll be sure to link this talk in the description as well, because I think it's awesome and I genuinely love Douglas Crockford. So but yeah, he is one of the people who really ushered in this new era of JavaScript is also anti this. So people are coming around. I see less and less people who are using this every day, which means we can move on as well to the next layer where things start to get dark. The bottom of the iceberg we're not fully in the deep just yet. The first here is zero results found. And once again, I'm going to ask chat, who has searched an error on Google, gotten zero results found, and immediately felt an impending sense of doom? I wanna see the ones for that. This is even more people than before. That's saying something. Everyone's felt this pain. Having an error that has no results, or even better, the only result of blog post you wrote about it in the past. Yeah, good times. I am sorry if you've encountered this. I hope you found a solution to your problems, and I hope you posted that solution somewhere so others would have it in the future. Caching headers. Oh boy, caching headers. Aha. Uh -huh. If you're not already familiar, you can specify cache control headers inside of a response 
from a web service. So if you send HTML, you can say how long that should be cached for. If you send JSON, you can do the same thing. And you have to hope that the CDN behaves correctly and the user's device does too. Cache control headers are far from a guarantee of anything at all, other than you're gonna have some complexity around stale content. We even have problems with cache headers for, of all things, our docs. So the docs for upload thing regularly have issues with caching, where when we make a change, all the old pages don't get revalidated. Cache headers are no guarantees, although they are very important. WebRTC, now we're talking about something I'm qualified in. WebRTC is the standard for kind of peer-to-peer -peer video that's focus is on latency, not on bit perfect content. So if you wanna make sure every pixel shows up exactly as intended, WebRTC is not the standard for you. WebRTC generally assumes some amount of potential spottiness and packet loss in order to get content to a user as quickly as possible with as low latency as possible and usually resilient enough to get the video even if their connection has issues. WebRTC is the standard everything from Zoom to Discord uses in order to get audio and video across the world and is usually doing some amount of peer-to-peer -peer as well. Although that is not necessary, you can have nodes that are running inside your own infrastructure that are effectively forwarders for the WebRTC where every user connects to those nodes. Those nodes do the play and the relaying between each other and then users connect to one of those and receive data from that instead. There's a lot of different providers that do WebRTC. We use Agora. There's also solutions like Daily and 100MS. I can't recommend any of them at this point in time because they're all kind of a mess in their own unique ways. Doing audio and video on the internet is tough and doing interactive live audio video in a way that doesn't suck for all your users is incredibly painful. If you're not already familiar with the service we built, ping.gg. Basically, it's Zoom for streamers. It was our goal to make it easier for me to bring somebody like Primogen on my show live to do a collaboration. We're used by everybody from like Linus Tech Tips to Vshojo, companies like Elgato and Microsoft for Xbox stuff. We're used a lot in the industry because we are the highest quality solution for collaborative video calls in a program like OBS. We had to go to hell and back in order to get this working well. And the amount of weird stuff I know about WebRTC as a result is hilarious. One of my personal favorites is that if you're using Firefox and there's WebRTC video coming in that is at higher than 30 FPS, every frame above that is going to memory leak and not get collected, which means that relatively quickly, that Firefox user is going to crash. We support 60 FPS video. So the only way we could support Firefox with ping is if we disable 60 FPS on the rooms where one person's using Firefox. Because again, this isn't the video that they're sending. So if you're on Firefox and you're locked to 30, you're still pulling 60 FPS video from other participants. You're still going to crash. So the only way we could maintain the level of quality we wanted to for the ping service was to ban Firefox entirely. So yeah, WebRTC is far from a solved problem. Hopefully you haven't had to deal with it yourself. Of the parts here, WebRTC is probably the one I have the most unique experience with. Regex is probably the one I go out of my way to avoid the most. My CTO is incredible, Mark, and a big part of why I hired him is he's our Regex guy. I don't have to deal with Regex because I have him. And now we also have ChatGPT to do Regex for me. I hopefully will never have to write a Regex again for the rest of my life, and I will go out of my way to continue not touching it because it makes me feel stupid and I don't like feeling stupid. So. Let's take a look at the other things here quick. Same site cookies are another wonderful pile of questionable things, especially once you get into subdomains and behaviors between things with that. Making sure your cookies are accessible in the correct domains and not on the incorrect domains, not fun. Yeah, same site and save origin and the differences between those. Yeah, uh -huh. could be a whole separate video. Gonna avoid that. <laughs> Closures are the behavior of most languages where when you have a tab section and you define things within it, can that be accessed from outside or not? And is that value enclosed inside of that section? And JavaScript in particular has some weird behaviors around closures, especially once you involve var and you're exposing variables in weird orders, where if you define a var or a function at the bottom of the file, you still access it at the top of the file. The behaviors around closures and like order of creation and access in JavaScript feel pretty strange at times. And I can't sit here and tell you confidently, I fully understand when values are and aren't going to be enclosed, but it is something JavaScript overall does decently enough that I don't think about it too much. If you have to think about it though, it absolutely belongs in this tier because we can go into everyone's favorite, rewrite it in Rust. Okay, one more chat poll. Who has had an engineer at their workplace unironically propose a Rust rewrite? Drop some ones in chat if you've had somebody at your workplace propose a Rust rewrite. Fewer than expected. And a lot of me LOLs. That's good to hear. We always ironically do it. 
<laughs> and then you're doing the Rust rewrite. So on the bright side, I do think Rust rewrites are better than Rust starting points. The, the value of Rust is that once you've written the code, you never have to touch it again. So if you know exactly what the thing's supposed to do, you have a perfect planned out understood spec and you want to write code that will fight you as you change it, but guarantee things will always be exactly the same. Rust is a good solution for that. If you want code that won't be touched for nine years and you can throw it in a box and expect it to rust, so to speak, without any issues, and then 10 years later, it's still running. Rust is the solution for that, which is why it makes sense to rewrite things in it once you need to. But it also means you need to have problems with your current solution that Rust can solve, and you need to not be changing that solution regularly. If your APIs are constantly changing, if your product managers are proposing new solutions every couple of weeks, Rust stops being a benefit and starts being a pain point really fast. But if you want code that never changes, it's a good solution. However, we're talking about the front end iceberg here, which means rewriting in Rust is talking about Wasm. Yeah. I hope you have a good reason for it, is all I will say there. Anyways, CJS ESM. Yeah, good old CJS ESM. TLDR is we changed syntaxes for a bunch of parts of JavaScript, kind of. And the interop between those two syntaxes is pretty rough. CommonJS is characterized by the require syntax when you're including something. And ESM is ECMAScript modules. It's characterized by using the word import instead. And these two behaviors work differently, behave differently. And now we have utter chaos as a result. Trying to make these interop, having packages that work in one way, not the other, dealing with this as both a web author and an application developer dealing with packages that have weird behaviors with either of these. But more importantly, as a library author, trying to make things that work properly in both CJS and ESM, none of this is fun. And if you have to deal with these things regularly, I am sorry. I do hope that we'll get into a smooth ESM future somewhat soon. A lot of progress is being made, especially with projects like Vite normalizing ESM as the standard. I do think we're going to get there, but we still have a long ways to go. One more in this section that I'm, again, uniquely qualified for, drag and drop UI. If you haven't built a drag and drop UI, you probably think it's simple. Just go find a package and put your elements in it and drag and drop things around. If only it was that simple. <laughs> My unique experience is I was the lead engineer on ModView at Twitch. Every single one of these elements is drag and droppable, resizable, dock and undockable, and all of them maintain their state as you move them around. I have a whole video coming out in the near future about building this and all of the craziness we had to do in order to make this level of dynamic drag and drop interface possible while also making it accessible. And it's hellish. Even if you think your drag and drop UI is good, does it work for somebody who doesn't have like dexterity that can't drag with the mouse? There's a lot of users with accessibility needs that don't have the drag and drop capability where they can't click and move the mouse at the same time. That's very hard to solve. <laughs> so yeah, drag and drop is not pleasant in a lot of cases for a lot of users. And if you haven't went down this road, I envy you. Things have gotten better with tools like D&D Kit, but we're still not all the way there and getting drag and drop right is still incredibly difficult. And make sure if you do rely on drag and drop for your interfaces, that you have some solution for people who are using the keyboard or have much more specific mouse targeting behaviors, or at the very least you have good enough defaults where none of this is needed at all. Yeah, be careful with your drag and drop stuff. We have a new section to dive into. Manatee land, the depths, where things start to get painful. And I immediately have an issue. I don't think WebSockets should be below WebRTC. WebSockets, although chaotic, I would flip these two. Because like getting WebRTC, knowing there's between like turn servers and stun servers. In WebSocket land, you have awesome solutions like Socket.io and Pusher. If you're already familiar with Socket.io, it's actually created by Guillermo Roche, who eventually went on to create Next.js and Vercel. And WebRTC has nothing anywhere near as good in terms of open standards that we can build around. So yeah, I think WebSockets are in a better state than this gives it credit. If you're not, somehow not familiar with WebSockets, it's a transportation method where a server and client connect to each other. And the server can send messages to the client, the client can send messages to the server without having to do posts back and forth. It allows for the server to update the client without the client having to poll constantly or using SSE and other types of event methods. WebSockets are probably the easiest way to get messages from a server to a client quickly live. And if you're using a chat solution like people are right now in my Twitch chat, you're probably using WebSockets for that. Very common standard. A lot of things rely on them. WebSockets are dope. They're not the easiest thing to set up. And there's a lot of awesome services that will offload your WebSocket work for you. There's a bunch of different use cases for WebSockets too. You can have live data updating where you have data you fetch from DB, but you want the data to update when it gets changed on your backend. Like my profile picture changes, you can use a WebSocket to update that in the UI for people who are currently on my page. You also can use WebSockets for temporary data that you don't care about lossiness of, like the current cursor location. I don't care about previous values. I just 
just care where it is right now. I also don't need to persist because I don't give a shit. And then you have live data that is persisted, but is more, it's not even persisted, it, it's ephemeral and you need the history, something like chat. So if you had a chat where you don't want to persist, but you want a chat history for when you're in the experience, that's different from WebSockets where you don't want the previous state, which is different from WebSockets where you're just sharing the DB state. These are all different use cases that have different solutions. And a lot of people try to provide all three at once. This is my WebSockets as a service diagram. As I mentioned, DB sync, which is when you want to synchronize the page or the user's application state with the database change, live data sync, which is things you don't care about previous states, but you do want the current value. So like where my cursor is located, if a user's online or not, those types of things. And then live events, which are things where you want the history, but you don't necessarily want to persist it or link that somewhere else. So these are three different things and they're solutions that combine live data sync and live events. There's also a lot of solutions that try to combine DB sync in there. Superbase and Firestore are the, the main DB sync solutions. And now there's a new crop of things trying to fill out this middle space and I don't trust them. So yeah, let's go back here because there's a bunch of other things in this depth, including mobile dialogues. Oh God. Uh, yeah, good luck with modals and things like those on mobile, especially once you have to deal with navigation, people sliding back and forward and like on iOS when the thing at the bottom gets like open and closed. I already complained about mobile dialogues. They're rough. But on the topic of mobile, CSS full height on mobile. <sighs> Who here has experienced the hell of trying to get 100% height working on mobile? Let's see some ones in chat. That's what I thought. Yeah, we've all been there. Doing this sucks. It genuinely sucks. With or without keyboard, again, with the additional problems that make this really fun. So if you're not already familiar with the hell that is CSS full height on mobile, when you use 100% height on certain mobile platforms, I'm looking at you, iOS, it accounts for the full height when the status bar is collapsed in its smallest form. But if that status bar gets bigger, which it does for many reasons, that height is now slightly bigger than it's supposed to be. And the result is that your page scrolls a very small amount when it's not supposed to at all. So if you want your page to be a fixed height with content centered in the middle of it. Yeah, min content is the, the new magic thing that supposedly solves this. Yeah, oh, and WebKit fill available is the other fun one. There's a bunch of these now. I hate this so much. So yeah, I'm sorry to everybody who has to deal with this, which is probably a lot of you, and it's not fun. That's the CSS full height problem. Cookie banners, <laughs> cookie banners. Cookie banners are a necessary evil due to the EU having specific rules about cookies and how they track users. So if you have a cookie that does almost anything, you're expected to put a banner that says, by the way, we use cookies. Hit this to accept that we're using cookies and getting those set up properly, globally, not fun. V8 stack traces, so. <laughs> V8 is the engine that most JavaScript runs in nowadays, especially if you're using Node. But if you're using modern browsers like Chrome or any of the Chromium based browsers, V8 is the engine that your JavaScript is running in. V8 stack traces are the engine level trace of how your JavaScript ran. So that has both the JavaScript code that you're calling and the C++ code that is actually running that code. And these traces can get super complex super quickly. I've only needed to dig into these a few times due to weird stuff I was doing in Electron. And it is absolutely Absolutely miserable. Like, God, yeah, stack traces are rough. I'm starting to feel how deep we are now. The double tilde. If I recall, this is something about math. Chat, can you tell me what that is? Oh, people are already talking about it. It's math.floor for positive numbers. Let's try that quick. Huh, 4.8. And what happens if it's negative? And weird. Okay. This is some weird bitwise shit. I'm going to pretend that it doesn't exist and continue living life as though it doesn't exist. So it'll make me feel better. Dates. Ah. Let's see some ones in chat if date has ever hurt you in JavaScript. And that is the most aggressive I've seen the ones appear in chat on this stream. I would possibly put daytime in the like simplest seeming yet most painful in reality things. It's pretty rough. Temporal when? Someday. Temporal will not fix it, but temporal will hopefully make it slightly less bad. There's a fantastic video a number file did. This is an absolute classic. If you haven't already seen it, this was one of the original Tom Scott videos before he was like his own big separate creator talking about how miserable time zones are to manage yourself. I'll also throw this in the description. If somehow you haven't seen it, I would hope everybody has seen this already. It's an absolute classic. 
yeah, dates are rough, especially once you get into time zones. Things get really complex really quickly. Libraries like Moment, DateFNS, DayJS, and all these other things help, but none of them solve it. Dates are rough. Rewrite it back in JavaScript. Gotta love those projects that commit to something crazy like Rust and then realize their mistake and go back. Not everything will have this problem. Most will refuse to admit they made a mistake. I also hope this doesn't mean rewriting JavaScript instead of TypeScript. Regardless, when you get to that point, something went very wrong. Ow. Localization. Localization. You'd think by now the browser would have some way to update the string contents without having to build your own layer in JavaScript. Maybe some decade. But right now, localization is your problem as the developer. And we are so, so far from having this problem solved. What we would do at Twitch is we had a custom wrapper we built that every time you had a string that you were calling inside of your HTML or your JSX, so to speak, anytime a string was being put in there, you had to pass it through our translate function. And we had a code mod, it wasn't really a code mod, we had a pretty complex parser that would go through the entire code base, identify all of these unique strings and the tags for them, because so you had to put a tag to identify it as well. And the string itself was the key that would identify what should be there instead. And then we would send off this huge CSV with all of the changes diffed off to our translation team that would go through and translate each of those strings to all of the different languages we wanted to support and then generate this gigantic like translation JSON blob that would put the right value in for each of those locations depending on which language you had set. This is just how we did it. And I haven't seen anything that's particularly more compelling. <laughs> Getting localization right is not easy. And I am sorry to anybody who has had to build this themselves because there is no good generic solution for it. <sighs> and I'm seeing a bunch of people in chat saying they had to do basically the same thing. Once you get into right to left though, it becomes actual hell. Something I learned recently is that both Mac and Windows, when you use a localization that's right to left, they flip the whole Windows UI and the whole Mac UI right to left as well in order to make it easier to make sure the UI works as expected. Ah, <sighs> anyways, local first. Local first absolutely belongs here because God, uh, when you're doing web development, everything starts from a server. You can do a lot on client now in the world of single page apps and local storage and all the cool things you can do in the browser. But what happens if somebody's doing those things and then the server changes or they do something manual where they open up the terminal and, or they open up their console and they change something in their local data. Building a local first experience where you can go offline and have a good time, but also maintain that relationship between the server and the client when they are back online, it gets really rough. And it usually means you're building a very complex state machine on the client and then building some type of event system to synchronize that with the backend. Doing this correctly is very, very, very difficult because you inherently have a split brain where you have two sources of truth. You have the server and the client and they both live in their own worlds some amount. It can get pretty rough pretty fast. It's a huge part of why I tend to avoid local first experiences as much as I can. And anybody who promises they solve local first for you, like Firebase, they're just lying. It's not that simple. You can't just have your data provider create a local first experience, embedding all of their behaviors into a JavaScript bundle or your mobile app, and then expect it to work properly. And you'll end up with really weird synchronization issues, especially when there's users who are on old versions of mobile apps or websites. I tend to rely on the server as a source of truth and try to lock out as much as possible. Thankfully, the stuff I build kind of requires you to be online. Like, what's the Twitch offline experience? What's the ping.gg offline experience? What's the upload thing offline experience? None of these things work without the internet, like the expectation is terrible. But if you're building Notion, this is probably something you should think about. So yeah, hopefully you don't have to, but if you do, good luck and Godspeed. This is not a solved problem. And now we're in the very bottom. We're as deep as we can get. This is where things start to get incredibly painful. We're in the depths, the bottom of the front end iceberg. And we welcome ourselves here with a wonderful message. New response, wrapping new readable stream. Readable streams are a wonderful thing that hopefully we never have to touch because they're very, very painful. The amount of weird things I have heard about readable streams from Jared over on the Bun team, trying to get them to behave properly with everything from just HTTP to React is not fun. And having a stream that is now being turned into an HTTP response that hopefully it works on all the things you're using, but there's no guarantees there at all. Streaming a response is incredibly powerful. Wrapping that streamed response in a new response, things start to get chaotic fast. And I don't even want to know the weird behaviors and like the platform support and lack of support for doing this. So I'm just gonna thank the developers who are working hard on solving streaming for me so I don't have to, because I don't want to think about these protocols anymore. Microtask queue. <laughs> oh. 
my soul. Everything you know about the event loop, this is that, but worse. This is that, but a lot worse. <sighs> I don't even know how to summarize. Uh, let's see what comes up. Microtask is a short function which is executed after the function or the program which created it and exists. It exists and only if the execution stack is empty, but before returning control of the event loop being used by the user agent to drive the script's execution environment. Did you see how many conditions there are here? It runs after the function that created it exits. If the execution stack is empty, before returning control of the event loop driving that execution. Ah. <laughs> Now we get some fun type of stuff. Type of one, two, three, so this is an array, which means obviously the type of that is object because there's like three types in JavaScript. So yeah, there's a lot of things that types are not what you would expect them to be. But specifically the type of an array being an object sucks because if you wanna know if something's an array, you can't do type of thing is array. You have to use array dot is array. So const sum r equals one, two, three. Type of sum r is object, but array dot is array sum r is true. Yeah, good times, time zones. We kind of touched on this with dates, but time zones are hellish. They are they are rough. Uh, watch the video I mentioned earlier by Tom Scott over at Number File. The amount of things you don't know about time zones is hilarious, especially when like random countries decide they're not gonna follow the time zone they're in anymore, or they're gonna start or stop doing daylight savings or the specific holiday where they're gonna behave differently. Time zones are painful. Good luck. Getting close to the end, guys. Hopefully we'll have smooth sailing from here. But then I see source maps and I realize it's only going to get rougher. Ah, getting source maps working without sending them to the user, getting this working with Sentry or Highlight or whatever other provider you're using is hellish. And I'm sorry to anybody who's had to do it. WYSIWYG editors. This stands for what you see is what you get. And yeah, WYSIWYG is an editor where you type and it shows you what you've typed rather than just showing you the content. So if you're using something like Markdown and you're using it on GitHub, you might type in the hash and then type some text and then the preview tab will show you it. But if you're using something like I am here with Notion, I can type that hash and it immediately kicks me into heading. And if I type a word, highlight it and use a command like command I, it will italics it and show me the italics here. Non-WYSIWYG editors would show you the actual code. So if I go to like guest on GitHub, hello, what's up? Here it just shows the text, but if I go to preview, it will render this as expected. So this is not a WYSIWYG editor, where Notion is a WYSIWYG editor. So now what you have to deal with is inputs, where you're rendering something different than the input has in it. And that's where things get particularly hellish, because browser inputs kind of expect the content of the input to be the thing that you input, not to be rendered entirely differently. And bouncing between input and your different rendering layer on top of it, miserable, absolutely miserable. And I commend the teams that have made this viable because it is not pleasant. Speaking of unpleasant, the Samsung browser. Oh man. The Samsung browser is actual hell. For whatever reason, on a lot of devices, Samsung has decided to not use Chrome and instead use their own thing. Imagine IE, but on lower spec hardware, really bad internet connections and no documentation or standards whatsoever. And way fewer users, so it's harder to justify supporting it. Users of old Samsung phones and like cheap Samsung phones, not installing a better browser means it's really, really hard to get your stuff working in these weird targets. Somebody mentioned it is based on Chrome. I'm sure it probably is some amount, but I'm sure the version of Chrome it's based on is ancient, and I'm sure it's very poorly supported and has a bunch of weirdness in it. I once opened one of my websites in the Samsung browser, and it didn't even render SVGs correctly. So I'm going to agree here that Samsung browser near the bottom, if this has come up for you before, if you've had to think about the Samsung browser at your job as a web dev, you're very, very deep in hell, and I am sorry. And now we're in the last two. We got some fun generic type wizardry here. So what the hell is going on here? This... <sighs> trying to translate this and what it's meant to do. I know what all the parts do here, but I can't actually guaranteed give you the whole for it. Is empty? Oh yeah, this is, is empty. I think this is the type. Is, is this to see if two arrays are equal? God, what is this for? So the ternary and ternary is necessary because of how TypeScript works, sadly. Let me break this down a bit. I'm gonna pull up the snippet here. There's a couple dumb things you need to understand about TypeScript for this to make any sense. What it's doing is checking if something's a tuple or not, which is weird and kind of dumb. But the, the way this works, and the reason there's so many ternaries is that you don't have conditionals in type definitions. We can't use JavaScript if syntax in the type def because the type def exists outside of the runtime. However, ternaries, do still work because they could be inline compiled. It, as a result, if you want a conditional type in TypeScript, you have to define it yourself. And you do that with a bunch of nested ternaries. We have this first check that T extends an array that has any as the first element and then triple dot any 
array after. This means it has at least one element because this could resolve to never, which is annoying, but good to know. So now we know it has at least one element. So we go in here, we grab the triple.any in the front again, and then infer underscore. This is the part that I'm least familiar with. Let's see what ChatGPT says it does. Our next is t extends triple.any infer will always be true, while infer tries to infer the last element. Array is a tuple, so this will always result zero if t is an array. The infer clause is more useful when you want to capture and utilize the inferred type, but here is simply used for a check and the inferred type underscore isn't used further. Yeah, it checks if there's anything after, which makes little sense to me because this would prevent there from being any after. And then the zero or one, these are like the true or false resolutions for each of these paths. Yeah, this is chaos. I am happy this is not where I spend my time in my life. This is why I'm the second best TypeScript YouTuber and we rely on our good friend Matt Pocock to do the, the harder things so we don't have to. This is hell and no application dev should ever have to use this. If somebody exposes a tuple type in your code base and they did this behind the scenes for you, dope. It's actually not that complex. God damn it. I mean, the, the syntax for it is, but what it does is relatively simple. Regardless, this is why I at the very least try to name my generics in my types so it's clear what it's doing and ideally comment the hell out of them so people know what they're doing. Yeah, big generics like this are scary and you shouldn't write them in your application code. Yeah, their syntax is more complicated than it needs to be, but yeah, these things are not easy to do right. And now our final piece of this chaotic iceberg, 2023 Internet Explorer support. Even Microsoft doesn't do this. Internet Explorer has been very dead for a while. Windows uses Edge now, and Edge is based on Chromium now. So 2023 IE isn't something that, that exists in the traditional sense. But if you do have users that are stuck on IE for a bunch of random things, like if you're using weird old Windows XP terminals at your hospital, you need to be able to support that still. And if you're stuck doing that for some reason, I am so incredibly sorry. It is not fun having to give up all of the innovation of the last 20 years just because some of your clients are on old hardware. I had to convince Twitch and I was one of the, the loudest people at Twitch. We deprecated IE support after Google did. Hell, I think we did it after Microsoft did because we thought that there were some users in South Korea that were in like the South Korean like gaming bars, like the places you go to just like play video games. You pay a fee for a few hours and you get to use their powerful gaming PC. A lot of those had Internet Explorer with weird metered connections set up and we thought we were going to lose a lot of our market share people playing and streaming in those internet cafes in South Korea if we stop supporting IE. I said that's dumb and stupid and we should not support it and eventually got enough agreement that we did. And yeah, don't support IE unless you have to. And if you have to, I'm so sorry. I hope they're paying you accordingly. <sighs> have I covered everything? That was awful. I mean, this was fun. And obviously, huge shout out to Lee over at Vercel for making this awesome free content. And when I say free, I mean very painful content because this took like way too long. God bless my editor for turning this into a watchable video. What did you learn from this? What were your favorite and least favorite parts of the front end iceberg? Do you have a little more respect for the hell that we go through every day as web developers? I hope so, because this it's just not easy, although it is fun and I do genuinely love it. If you want to watch me suffering more going over a lot of things in HTML you probably haven't heard about, I'll put a video in the corner where I go over every single HTML element and rank them for some reason. God, why did I do this? Anyways, thank you all. As always, appreciate you immensely. Peace, nerds.